had a fairly long relationship with National Wildlife Federation. They've helped us with schoolyard habitat designs and plantings. We have a certified schoolyard habitat right outside our National Wildlife Visitor Center. Uh, they've provided technical assistance on some of our teacher workshops and of course today they're providing close to 200 people to do a, a number of different projects on the refuge so we're very grateful for that. The Patuxent Center and National Wildlife Federation share many common histories and missions. Two prominent ones today is the influence of Ding Darling on our founding and the celebration of our 75th anniversaries. Today we do celebrate what Ding Darling has meant to our future, his legacy. Dick Darling understood as, as the founder of the National Wildlife Federation that we are all responsible for the management of the lands in which we live. Our partner, American Beauties, which provides native plants, has provided a variety of native plants to um, fill in this area. So some of them are wonderful pollinator plants like the mountain mint. Um, it'll be a buzz with bees come summer. Some of them are great ground covers like Pennsylvania sedge and the wood fern. Um, and we also have uh, golden ragwort, which is another good pollinator plant. It's an early spring bloomer, yellow flowers. So we're basically putting in a meadow. And within a couple of years, we should have a beautiful meadow with a variety of native plants here. And in spring and summer, it should be a buzz with pollinators. And you know, other small mammals like rabbits or quails, um, depending on their availability here, um, may also inhabit that and use it for cover. My name is Angel Luis Alicea Lopez Martinez Cruz Andino. Just call me Ali. <laughs> I'm from Puerto Rico and I am one of the crane technicians here. We try to disguise a human form from our chicks so in that way they don't know that we are human and they become uh, unused to being seen the human form. Uh, what we try to do is uh, we teach very young whooping cranes to become full-grown whooping cranes that are completely wild and trying to restore the whooping crane back to a sizable um, uh, population. Whooping crane technicians do a lot of work. We, besides the fact that we are actually trying to save these animals, we do a lot of work with the repairs of their pens, uh, the care of the whooping cranes, and many other cranes that are in our, in our charge. We have two other species. We have the Florida Sand Hill crane, and we also have the Greater Sand Hill crane, uh, which are part of our flock that help believe it or not, to raise the whooping cranes because they are um, foster parents or foster hatchers for many of the, the, the whooping crane eggs. We've been uh, raising whooping cranes for about 44 years to try to restore, like I said, the population. Uh, and there's three projects going on right now. We have the ultralight project trying to restore the, the eastern migration population, which migrates from Wisconsin all the way to Florida. We have also a new project which is going on in Louisiana which we're trying to restore the uh, non-migrating -migra population of whooping cranes which there are 10 of them so far and there will be more added uh, hopefully this year and there's also a new project which is the parent rearing project which we're trying to teach um, young whooping cranes that are going to be with their with parents here that are going to be taken to Wisconsin and they're going to be released as uh, adopted children to other whooping cranes. Bees were declining, butterflies were declining, some of the flies pollinate too and the problem was that there was no other information so we don't have information about how they're doing, what their status is, there's no Bureau of Census of Bees and we're doing things like putting labels on them. We're always interested in finding out the status of any species of plant or animal in the United States. That's sort of our job, is to make sure that the nation's resources are in good shape. So we have to decide what's our primary objectives as we go through the list of all the different species around. Bees very clearly have a relationship to our economy through pollination of crops and to another entire big chunk of the environment, which is plants. So native plant species, for example, 75% of the plants in North America require an insect, almost always a bee, to pollinate them so that they produce seeds so that it increases on. What we're doing, my lab, and these people are now helping, 
is setting the baseline and then going into the future so that we can now say, starting in 2011, the bees of North America look like this, and then we're going to be able to look at change over time so that in a few years we can give you an idea on whether things are increasing or decreasing. Got a problem in New Mexico, but New England's doing well. These species are declining, these species are increasing. That's what we can't do now, but that's our objective. These are the, um, the Patuxent's earthworm plots. Um, they were established in 1966 to study the uptake of pesticides, DDT, Dieldren, and Heptachlor by earthworms. We studied these earthworms over 20 years, okay? It's been 45 years since that first study, so now we're going back to see if there's still any pesticide residues left in the worms. The pesticides are accumulated in the worms, so they're found at much higher concentrations in the worms than in the soil. And the other scary part about it is that the pesticides are really persistent in the worms. After 20 years, there's still high levels of pesticides in the worms. Nothing's been done to this plot. One application in 1966, and you still find a lot of it uh, 20 years later. And by a lot of it, I know how to interpret those residues in terms of what that would mean to birds feeding on the worms.